But I remember my first day at the jail, my first class comes in and there was a student who I just failed at the comprehensive high school, you know, before the summer. And so that was my wake up call. I failed this kid, he's in jail. And so it really made me question everything from attendance policies to grading policies, to pedagogy, to my relationship building. What can I do to keep these kids out of the system? As many of us are social distancing and hunkered down in our homes, we crave inspirational stories. That's why we're sharing our interview with the 2019 National Teacher of the Year, Rodney Robinson. For 20 years, Rodney has inspired countless students as a high school teacher in Virginia teaching social studies and history. In this episode, we discuss Rodney's work on equity in the classroom and how teacher education programs can do even more preparing teacher candidates for creating equitable environments. He also shares his unique experience working with students affected by the school to prison and pipeline. It's a fantastic episode, so let's jump right into my interview with Rodney. Well, Rodney, welcome to the Teacher Education Podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm excited. I don't think I've ever interviewed anybody with such an extensive Wikipedia page. <laughs> it's really oh, wow. impressive. <laughs> I guess I need to go check that out. I haven't checked it out in a while. Because the situation that is going on right now, I have to ask, what is your advice for teachers that are being asked to finish out the year online? <laughs> With the coronavirus, it's it's on everybody's mind. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's uh, man, it brings up a lot of inequities in our system when you ask teachers to finish online, starting with the fact that not all students have access to online materials. Then add in the fact because teachers don't get paid a lot, a lot of teachers do not have online access at home. Some of them have to use coffee shops, libraries, and those places are closed to the public right now. So it really is an equity issue when you talk about online learning right now. And hopefully when this is over, you know, we get some help from con Congress to address these needs and providing, you know, nationwide broadband to rural areas, to inner city areas, to areas that don't really have access to it. And it's really important if you want to give all students an equitable education that they have access to these tools. It's true because I didn't even think in my experience it would affect my old school. I was talking to my parents and we're in Washington. We're at the base of Mount Rainier, like the last before you get to the national park. And one of the small towns doesn't have internet. Where I grew up in King, in King Wilm County, there's very little internet or you're paying two to 300 bucks a month for internet. And that's just not fair to all to students. Uh, now, I know that you entered the world of education because of your mother, Sylvia. Can you tell me about your mother and how she inspired you to become a teacher? Well, um, she wanted to become a teacher, but she never got the formal education just due to segregation and poverty in rural Virginia. However, she didn't let that stop her. She ran an in-home daycare, and she would tell people in the neighborhood, you know, just bring your kid by, bring some food if you got it, and pick them up by 5 or 6 o'clock. And so there were nights where I would go to sleep and I'd wake up and there'd be two more kids in my bed. I'm wondering where they come from. But it was just kids from the neighborhood that my mom would take in. And she would do it for little or no pay because she felt it was a job of the older generation to, to look out for the young people. And she still does that to this day. As a matter of fact, I think there's some kids at her house right now, even with all this going on. <laughs> so she's continuing that, le that legacy. And so seeing her interact with students and not students, but kids, and just watch her teach and treat everybody equitably, that really inspired me to want to be a teacher. How many students do you think she's worked with over the years, or, or children? Oh, gosh. I have, I mean, literally, every. I would say at one point, every kid in our neighborhood growing up was at the house at one point or another, because it, like I said, they just knew if I needed a, a babysitter, even if it's for a couple hours, I could just drop them off at Sylvia May's house and, you know, they'll be okay. And so I would, oh my gosh, there were some days there was 20, 25 kids there, you know? Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it wasn't just my mother. Of course, I had older sisters and older cousins who were there as well, who helped my mother out. But it was just a place of love for the entire neighborhood. Everyone came through, everyone felt love, and it was just the communal meeting place. What an amazing experience growing up. Your mother sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah, she is. You've been quoted as saying a student teacher relationship is the most important tool in fostering academic success. I work hard to get to know as well as understand my students. Can you give us three actionable ways that 
uh, that teachers can get to understand and know their students? Well, number one, the first thing you have to do is you have to understand your neighborhood or your community that you're teaching in. You have to ingrain yourself in the community, in the neighborhood, but also the history in the community of that neighborhood because it helps you understand how your students ended up in the situation they were in. And so that's really key. Just immerse yourself in the neighborhood. Uh, the second key is just to listen. You know, just be that ear, be that non judgmental ear that kids need because kids, they're dealing with all sorts of emotions and problems. And they, sometimes they just want an outlet. And as long as you're that non judgmental outlet, you can just let the kid go. Once the kid gets to know you, then it'll come more and more. And you can build on that relationship. And the third thing is just support your kids. Just support them no matter what they do, when they make mistakes, just keep supporting them. I remember Ben Talley, a Hall of Fame teacher from Bristol, Virginia, he and I were having a conversation and he said, there's no secret to working with tough children or any children. The key is just to love them. No matter what they do, love them. When they make mistakes, love them. When they don't believe in themselves, love them. And it may not sink in while they're in their classroom, but one day they're going to remember all the love and support that you gave them. The first one you mentioned was knowing your community. How how do you get to know your community? Should they be involved in uh, in different or like ch in churches, organizations? Like how how do you get to know your community that well? It's whatever the heartbeat of the community is. Some communities, the church is the heartbeat of the community. For me, um, I coach football when I started teaching. And so the key way into the community was to go to the little to the rec league games or the little league football games and get to know the coaches and the players and the parents. And so then you begin you build that sense of community so that when a parent, you know, sees your name on their child's you know, schedule, they okay, I know him. He's good, he's been around. And so we have positive communication. And so the key is to keep all communication positive. And so therefore, when something has to be negative, it's much more well received if you have a positive relationship. And so that's what I mean by ingraining yourself in the community. Whatever the heartbeat of your community is, you should be there. You know, you shouldn't just leave every day and go home at 3.30, 4.30. Sometimes it's okay to go to school events, to go to neighborhood events, block parties, whatever's going on and just get to know your community and the heartbeat of it. That's great advice. I like those three different things. And a few years ago, you started teaching at the Virgie Benford Education Center. Can you tell us about why you decided to begin teaching there and a little bit about the Virgie Benford Education Center? There's a school inside the Richmond Juvenile Jail. You know, all of my students are aged 12 to 19. Some of them have committed minor offenses such as drugs. Some of them have, excuse me, are accused of major offenses such as murder. And so it's really important. I tell them all the time that you know, America's a country of second chances. And if you want a second chance, a high quality education is the best way to take advantage of your second chance. And so it's really, you know, a really good school. And um, the reason I'm, I went there because I had taught for 15 years in mainly high need schools and I was starting to become a little burnt out. And I remember getting a call from the principal of the school who's a friend of mine. We worked together for, I mean, we've, been to, we've known each other for a good 15 years. And she called and asked if I know if I knew anyone who would be interested in teaching history at her school, and and we were talking. Then she said, "Okay, here's the deal. I, I want to know if you're you're interested, because I think you you would be impactful from day one." And so then I was like, eh, "I didn't know if that was my thing," but then in 2015, that's when the um, U.S. Department of Education released their first major report on the school to prison pipeline, and Virginia was the number one state and referring students to juvenile detention centers. And so to me, that was sort of a sign. It was like, I could read books and study reports, or I could go work in the prison system and see the kids and get to know them and use those field experiences to develop alternative programs. What has surprised you as you started uh, to explore more about the school to prison pipeline? Well, my first thing that surprised me was at first, I didn't believe in the school to prison pipeline. I felt there was a poverty to prison pipeline in America and that we criminalized being poor. But I remember my first day at the, at the um, jail, my first class comes in and there was a student who I just failed at the comprehensive high school, you know, before the summer. And so that was my wake up call. I failed this kid. He's in jail. 
And so it really made me question everything from attendance policies to grading policies to pedagogy to my relationship building. What can I do to keep these kids out of the system? And so it really was an eye-opening thing once I got there to see, okay, there's a direct correlation. So now let's focus on some of these things that are some of the students' issues of why they ended up here. And as you uh, have observed and taught there, have you developed any solutions or programs or ideas that you think that can help mitigate the problems of the school to prison pipeline? Well, to me, one of the, the most actionable things that we can do is we can remove police officers from school, plain and simple. A lot of my students, their first charge is something as simple as disorderly conduct in school. And then if you get disorderly conduct, they're going to add a resisting arrest charge to that. And so it's those little things, allowing police officers to handle school discipline. There's, that's not a school to prison fight. That's a direct, you know. This is a direct pipeline to the prison because you're instead of getting disciplinary referrals, you're getting criminal charges. And so that's the first thing we do. We can remove school resources from resource officers or police officers, because that's really what they are, away from school because they don't have the training, the educational background or anything to deal with school discipline. You know, uh, I think principals should be the only ones and teachers should be the only ones in charge of student discipline. And so to me, that's probably the most actionable thing we could do. And then once we remove them, we can start using that, those, that funding to put more mental health counselors in school, more social workers, more school counselors, because school resource officers, police officers, they can break up a fight. But if you're not getting to the core issues of why there was so much aggression, you're not solving the problem. And so it's really important that we remove them and replace them with trained mental health professionals and restorative justice programs and anything to teach students how to resolve their anger and the conflict they have that, so that it doesn't end up in criminal charges. I would never have thought that the first uh, offense that students have usually was a, is directly because of school. That's really interesting. So that's really insightful. I'm glad that you shared that with us. Uh, because so many teacher education professionals listen to our podcast, I want to ask you about your experience as a teacher candidate and working with new teachers. Uh, reflecting on your training and what you know now, would you change anything about your preparation to become a teacher? Um, I think my college did a Virginia State University. I think they did an amazing job at preparing me for for college for um, teaching because they focused on relationships. And even though when I, once I started teaching, it took me uh, uh, about two or three years before I really fully understood the importance of relationships. But I remember something as simple. We had my first, I guess, freshman year in college, we had a class of 150 students in nerve science. And I remember the dean of science departments walks in. And he's like, oh, no, this class is too big. You know, and so he sends everybody back to their rooms and said new schedules are coming. And so what he did was he broke the class down into three classes of 50 students and then put two teacher's aides aides in each one of those classes. And his reasoning was, there's no way a professor can get to know 150 students. You can't build a relationship. And so I'm gonna break it down, put more professors and more student aides so that you students can build relationships that would ensure your success in school. And so it's those little things like that that were happening at my college was preparing me for education, understanding that it's relationships. and then. I think my third year teaching is when it's actually no fourth year teaching is when it really set in because after my third year I kind of got fired from a school you know <laughs> I didn't know kind of I did get fired from a school and then I went <laughs> and I went to the, another school and I remember the new principal who was much more supportive he asked me he said who are your best students in your class and I said my football players he asked me why and I was like because they know me I know them we had that expectations. And so he asked me, he said, why can't you have that relationship with all of your students? And that was the moment when it clicked. It's not about pedagogy. It's not about anything but building relationships, believing in the students and having the students believe in you. And once you do that, then you can take learning anywhere that you want to go or anywhere that the students want to go. Interesting. Yeah, this is a theme, relationships. You keep coming back to that. That's that's fantastic. Uh, as you've worked and observed with new teachers coming in over the past two decades of your career, are there any insights that you would like to give? Because like I said, we have teacher prep program professionals listening. 
Is there any insights that you would like to give teacher prep programs as to what you're seeing when we have new teachers starting? Um, of course, there's the relationship port, you know, aspect of it. But we really need to start having conversations about educational inequities. These conversations surrounding race, surrounding sexual orientation, because these are factors that play a major role in holding some students back, whether it's holding them back personally because they're trying to figure out who they are or whether whether there are systematic barriers in place that must be discussed on how to eliminate those if you want all students to be successful. You know, I, I was recently speaking at, a, I'm not going to say the name of the university, but it was a university, and it was about, I guess about 100, you know, college of teacher candidates. I guess 90 of them were white women. And they were asking me some really good, intense questions about race. And I was really, you know, I was empowered by that. I was like, these students are having questions that veteran teachers aren't having. But then also I got a little disappointed because I spoke to the School of Education and I asked them, why don't you have any black faculty members? Because these are questions that these students have been having. And you could tell they were holding them, waiting for an opportunity to speak to a black male teacher. And so they were just letting them go. And so I, I told the school, you need to really make sure that your staff is diverse if you truly want to serve the needs of teacher candidates and have those important conversations. The Teacher Education Podcast is brought to you by GoReact. GoReact is currently used by 500 universities nationwide to conduct online assignments and assessments. With GoReact, you can record and give feedback remotely to students demonstrating new teaching methodologies or for student teaching observations. To see how GoReact can make online learning easier and more effective for you, visit goreact.com slash teachers. That's G-O-R-E-A-C-T dot com slash teachers. How do we get more diverse faculty and more diverse uh, school, uh, more diversity with our school teachers? Oh, wow. That's, oh, wow. <laughs> That's really what I've been talking about a lot lately is how do we get more diversity? One thing I always says it starts with the experiences of the students in school. You know, our black and brown students and our exceptional education students, they have the worst experiences in our schools. And so it's no wonder that those are the biggest areas of teacher shortage black and brown teachers and exceptional education teachers. Because I want to say, no one wants to return to the scene of their trauma as a career field. So it's really important that we you know, start um, culturally responsive teaching, anti-racist teaching, um, just curriculum development, just having the students have better experiences in school. And that's one way I think we can really have an impact. And so they can see, hey, Teaching is a viable opportunity for me. I see people who look like me who are doing great jobs in education. Um, the second thing we can do is uh, eliminate some of these barriers that are in the way. You know, you know, we talk about culturally biased testing that keep teachers out of the field. Um, we also want to talk about just simple economics. For example, Virginia had, uh, it used to be in Virginia, you had to have five years of college to get a teaching degree. You know, you can get a four year education degree. And so that was really holding back a lot of students, especially, especially minority students, the first generation college students, because they were struggling to pay for four years of college. And now if I want to be a teacher. I have to add on a whole another year of college just to get that degree. And so luckily, Virginia has now reduced that and got have gotten some four year education degrees. But those things are issues creating spaces for teachers of color because they're leaving the field at a rate twice, you know, other teachers because they're so burnt out by the invisible tax. So we have to create spaces for those teachers because we can get as many new teachers of color as we want, but if we're not retaining the ones we already had, we're just pouring water into a hole, into a bucket with hole in it. And so that's really important. What do you mean by uh, give them a space? Well, there's, John, Secretary of Education, former Secretary of Education, John King, talked about the invisible tax. The invisible tax is basically extra duties or extra cultural tax placed on the teachers of color, such as being a cultural liaison, such as having these conversations about race in class, or being just that go-to person for all the students of color. I remember I was at an elementary, a middle school, and I was speaking to one of the teachers of color, and every Black kid in that school 
stop by that teacher's class that morning just to say what's up, you know, and just to see his face and get that that common reassurance that, okay, today is going to be a good day. But just little things like that, just they weigh on teachers, especially when those students are also bringing their problems because they don't see anyone else who looks like them. And so it really burns those teachers out. And then having to deal with the constant microaggressions of race. And so those things just, they really weigh on teachers. And so it's important that teachers have a safe space so that they can explore these things with themselves. And, excuse me, and schools of education. I was at another school of education who claimed to be one of the top schools in the country. But when I had a conversation with their students of color, they were almost, tra- they, not almost, they were traumatized by their experience at that school because they didn't have a safe space where they felt that their opinions were valued or that they had, they were respected as educational professionals. This actually leads really uh, nicely into the next question that I wanted to ask you. So you've worked with James Foreman, a Pulitzer Prize winning author on developing a curriculum units on race. From your work on the project and experience in the classroom, can you give our listeners three pieces of advice about creating a safe and equitable space in the classroom? Um, Number one is set your rules. Set your rules of conversation, your rules of debate, your rules of respect, those non-negotiables. And once you have those set, then students feel more comfortable expressing their opinions. And and that's hard for teachers. Some teachers, it's it's easy. Some teachers, it's going to take a while, a lot of trial and error, a lot of failures. But eventually, if you set those rules of expectations in the classroom, of behavior for conversations, then you can start having those conversations. The second thing you have, excuse me, you have to listen. You have to listen to the students, listen to their concerns. I think a lot of times teachers get so caught up in wanting to fix problems that you don't really hear the problem that the student has. Sometimes you have to sit back, listen, understand the problem. And then three, always propose actionable solutions. Nothing is worse than a student having a problem and a teacher responding, yeah, that's just the way it is. No, you have to have actionable actionable things that a student can do to solve those issues. And that's one of the things I took on when I started working at the detention center was as problems came up in the detention center, we were like, hey, this is how you handle it, whether it's write a letter to, you know, detention supervisor, write a letter to the mayor. You know, me. I've had meeting. I have had listening sessions with state senators, with the mayor, with just different people who can come in and provide answers to some of the questions and problems that they have. And so, and then for just model, model the behavior you want. If you see problems in your school and you work toward fixing them, then the students will buy in, and they'll work toward fixing their problems. And so that that's probably the best thing is just model the behavior you want the students to have. I'm curious about the third one too, actionable solutions. How can you help give actionable solutions if some of the problems are probably systemic? What is your big issue? What is the issue that you most want to address? And then focus on that. Something as simple, um, at our detention center, the kids, you know, every day, the kids only ate three times a day, 5.30 in the morning, 12 noon for lunch, 5.30 in the afternoon. So when they're sitting in class, they're hungry. uh, at about nine o'clock, they're hungry. They can't focus on class. So it's like, okay, if you want extra meals, okay, let's raise this issue with detention supervisor. Now let's take it to the mayor, you know, and bring them in and let's have a conversation. And now we have to meet with state officials, federal officials. And it took about six months of just bureaucratic red tape, but eventually they were able to get snacks. And just something that's like that, that's a big victory for a student who's never been listened to before. Because most of our students in detention have had bad experiences with school. They've been clogs in the system that have just been passed on from one person to the next. But doing something like this, say, okay, we have a voice. It makes a difference. And it inspires them to take on the next challenge. And so recently, you know, last year, I remember there was an issue in the facility. And I remember the kids were immediately on it. They wrote letters to their parent, to the mayor, you know, and it was a major issue within... 48 hours, the issue got solved. Whereas the kids hadn't been pushing for that issue, I don't think it would have been as serious or it would have gotten solved. And so that's the key, teaching them that they have a voice and that little things that you do make a difference. 
It sounds like you're creating a whole bunch of grassroots activists, which is fantastic. They're learning how to have their voice heard. That's really empowering. Yes, yes. That's that's all, that's my ultimate goal as a teacher, especially as a social studies teacher. I tell them, be the change agent that you want to see. Be the change you want to see in your community. Now, I ask all of our guests a question, and we call it our magic wand question. And <laughs> what? so the magic wand question is, if you have, a, you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about U.S. educational system, the policy, or the profession, what would it be? I'll keep it simple. I think, it, and it goes back to Dr. Lindsay and her study at John Hopkins University that said, you know, teach students, students of color, especially black students, who have a black teacher in the elementary grades are 39% less likely to drop out of house, excuse me, drop out of school and 19% more likely to go to college. So if I could wave a magic wand that could solve a lot of issues, I think it would be just get us more teachers of color in the classroom. Yeah, because it, it helps all students, not just students of color. Because imagine how less racist our society would be if white students had teachers of color in front of them showing them the you know how to navigate through life. It just makes things much easier. I often say everyone wins with diversity. And so if we could get, just get more diversity in the classroom, I think we'll see things close like the achievement gap, the opportunity gap, because we have people there who understand the needs of underserved populations. And so they can help advocate to end those issues. So if I had to choose one, that would be it. I've asked that question for a lot of our uh, guests, and that's the first time I've heard that answer. And I love that answer. That's fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, at the end of our podcast episode, we do a lightning round. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you just need to respond with a one word or one sentence answer. Okay. Are you, are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. Favorite conference to attend? Uh, definitely Educators Rise. And I love those kids having fun. And just being teenagers, I mean, that's, as a teacher, that's what you love, is just students who are inspired. And then you got a room full of future educators. And so just, I often say, whenever you get educators in the room, magic organically happens. So, and to get all those kids in that room, it was just so much fun, that conference. Your favorite movie? Favorite movie? Uh, Hoodlum. It's 1995, Lawrence Fishburne and Cicely Tyson movie. It's just, it's about... 1920s, 1930s Harlem gangsters. And there's a, to me, I like it because there's a lot of underlying tones of race and power and entrepreneurship. And it's really a really a good movie. I'll have to add that to my list. Your go-to resource for teaching. My go-to resource for teaching is usually Teaching Tolerance or the Stanford Education Group. And one piece of advice for new teachers. Uh, if you're not having a rough time, you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your first, your first year is difficult, but you just have to survive and get through it. I remember I was speaking to a student of mine who I had my first year teaching, who's now a teacher herself. And she was talking about a lot of fun things we did in my class, my, my first year teaching. I remembered none of that. I just remember <laughs> surviving that year. And get to the end of the year, it's like, who I made it. And so it's just, it's just understand it's going to be rough. But the key thing is to always learn from your failures because you will have lots of failures. A lot of people say, you know, Ooh, I, I was successful. I, to me, you learn more from your failure than you do from your success. Well, Rodney, thank you so much for joining us on the Teacher Education Podcast. This has been one of the most fascinating conversations I've had. I, I really have enjoyed it. And I know our listeners are going to love the insight and people that are teachers themselves or people that are in teacher preparation programs. I, I know we will all find it useful. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's been a pleasure. That's it for today. Don't forget to subscribe. If you like what you heard, please rate and review this podcast to help others find us. The Teacher Education Podcast is brought to you by GoReact. This episode was hosted by me, Hilary Gamblin, and produced by Daniel Burt, Joseph Winter, and Jordan Harris. Chad Jardine is our executive producer. Guests on the podcast are expressing personal opinions for informational purposes only. They're not acting as official representatives for their universities or organizations. 